As Father Alessandro said, I'm grateful to you for devoting uh, a morning to um, trusting that I'm going to say something useful. Um, and uh, <clears throat> there will be discussion as well, you know, so this will be, I, uh, I have an outline I'll show you in a, in a minute of uh, where we'll take it for the morning, but it'll involve uh, discussion. So uh, as you listen, feel free to either write down or just think of, of, of questions or, or reflections, additional thoughts you might have to whatever I, I offer this morning. Uh, but again, thank you all, and, and thank you, Father, for everything you've done to make it possible. Um, so yes, he, as he said, tomorrow I will be speaking uh, on, on themes out of the book that I wrote called How to Be a Sinner, and that's some of what I'm doing this morning, too. Uh, there will be just a little overlap between today's talk and tomorrow's. Um, but uh, this book, How to Be a Sinner, uh, on the way over here, Father said, how many times a day do you get somebody telling you, I don't need a book called How to Be a Sinner because I'm doing just fine on that <laughs> score. Uh, and that happens a lot. Uh, a lot of people tell me that. Uh, but you write the book that you need to read. You, I write books that I want to read or that I need to read. Um, you know, And so I recall, literally it just came to me uh, when I was reading in bed, uh, I guess I've, I've long been intrigued by the language that the church puts before us in its hymnography, uh, in its prayer life, uh, and even, you know, the language that the Bible puts before us in the Psalms. If we think of Psalm 51, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And the word sinner and the name sinner is something that we give ourselves all the time in the language of the church. And um, I have been very, very fortunate in my life uh, to have, I've never sort of left the church. You know, I, I've always sort of trusted that the church, whatever it's putting before me, uh, is gonna be for my healing somehow. And so that must include this language of sinner, which I, th I think for society and, and even for us, it, it, sounds, it, it can sound a little strange, um, especially when we're being told by so much of society to love ourselves, which we actually should do. I'm gonna to get to that later in the morning. Um, but we're supposed to affirm ourselves. We're supposed to have um, a good, healthy self-esteem and uh, I would stand by that. We, we, we do need to have healthy self-esteem. But how does, that, how does that work with calling myself a sinner, and in some cases calling myself a wretched sinner, and the worst of all sinners? And so in, in this spirit of trust, trust that the church must have something good in mind for me, for us, it, giving us this language, uh, I thought, uh, let's try to write something about this. And the, the moment I had that idea, I thought of the title, How to Be a Sinner. And I told my wife, we were, we were in bed reading, I said, how does that sound to you? She said, Peter, write it, do it, do the book. And so over the course of years, you know how it is, like when, when you're, you're thinking about things, um, it's like you develop a little a, a filter, like, and, and then suddenly something that somebody says or, or the morning's uh, scriptural readings that, that, that you read or something, and, and something comes up and, and, and you start taking notes and then your notes develop. And then finally, um, I gave a retreat at seminary. I, I volunteered, I said, can I give the Lenten retreat this year um, because I wanna work these themes out. I don't know, was, was that when you were there, Father? Uh, I gave a retreat on the theme, how to be a sinner, and, and eventually the book came. And um, Thanks to uh, my wife for editing it so well. It, it reads nicely. I, I can say that because I, I don't take credit for it. <laughs> That's her work, uh, that it reads so well. But um, this morning, what uh, I suggest we do, we have two sessions we're gonna go till about, what, 10, 10, 15? Yeah. Um, 
And uh, I want to kind of draw out these themes that I even just now began to introduce, uh, what it means to identify myself as a sinner, right? Um, if you, if you're, you're, you're giving yourself a name, right? Not just the name Peter or Father Basil or Anna, you know, you don't just, or Catherine, you don't just give yourself a name, but you give yourself a name like a vocation, right? If I give myself the name of musician, right? Uh, that means I make music and, and, or that I am uh, involved in producing music. So if I give myself that identity and that name of sinner, does that mean that I accept and encourage even myself to be a sinner? So the, opening out that kind of question and, uh, and really asking the question, does sin uh, define who I am? <coughs> Right? That's, 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 that'll be the theme, in a way, for the first part of the morning. And uh, we'll open that out into discussion. I'll, I'll make sure to allow at least 10, 15, or 20 minutes for, for, for discussion. Uh, and then we have a break. And then for the second session, really, uh, the, the, the title that we came up with for, for this morning uh, is drawn from our Lord's words in the Scripture. He, he says them twice in Matthew's Gospel. The same words, he says, whatsoever ye loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And so I want to explore uh, what Jesus might have meant when he said that to his disciples, and by extension, maybe he's saying it to us, that, um, that, what, that the attachments that we form to uh, each other's faults uh, are kept <laughs> not only on earth but in heaven and, and then our forgiveness our loosing our attachments to uh, each other's faults and grudges and all that uh, are a part of salvation really so like we actually play a part in not only our own salvation but each other's Okay, that'll be the theme for the second part of the morning, and there too we'll have some <clears throat> discussion time to uh, <clears throat> to work these things out, and uh, I hope it'll be of use. Uh, right, we open the morning with prayer to the Holy Spirit, O Heavenly King, and and we ask Him to come and abide in us, and uh, we ask um, that the Spirit inspire not only the, the speaker, uh, but all of us, uh, because this is all, uh, everybody in this room <laughs> is necessary as a part of what we're doing this morning. Uh, and so we pray for the Spirit's inspiration and guidance in, in this and in all we do. Um, all right, so we're good to go for that outline for the morning? <laughs> good, good. Um, so just a few issues um, that I've already begun to spell out, right? Uh, the language of sin and sinner, the, the identity of sinner, right? What it means to own that identity. Um, we'll be talking about that. And um, like I said, the power of the name. Um, naming is a very big thing uh, in the Bible, for example. When uh, Adam is... Uh, created by God, he, he's given the task of naming the animals. You know, he's, he's naming um, fellow creation, <laughs> you know, uh, other things in creation. And the fact that, that the human being is given that uh, vocation is very, very important. Naming something uh, is a way of, of, of consecrating it in a way, is saying, is, is somehow involving yourself in the vocation of that thing that you're naming, right? Uh, and we notice too in the, in the, in the Old Testament that at, at landmark moments of, of, of some of the patriarchs' lives, their name changes, right? Abram becomes Abraham. Right. Once he's kind of consecrated to the Lord, uh, later on, of course, Saul becomes Paul. You know um, how Christ names Peter. 
You know, they, these are significant things. And so naming is a very significant thing. And the names that we give ourselves uh, are important. And we have a, a, a baptismal name uh, that, that we uh, tend to, you know, repeat and hear as we receive the sacrament of communion, you know. Um, so when we name ourselves sinner, what's going on? <laughs> because normally what we're doing when we're naming is we're naming, um, we're naming something in, in, a, in a positive way. We're consecrating it, like I said earlier. So when I'm naming myself a sinner, what's going on? Uh, that's an important kind of an issue, I think, to kind of at least name, <laughs> name the issue uh, and think about it. One of the, one of the places I take that uh, question in, in, in the book is, is, to, is to say what we're doing when we're naming ourselves as sinner is it's maybe a little bit akin to when we're diagnosing uh, an illness. All right. In order to come up with uh, the right medication or the right uh, solution, the right uh, remedy for something that's troubling us, we have to know what the disease is. We have to know what the problem is, right? And so uh, lately, my wife and I have been binge watching House. Have you been watching? Have you watched House ever? Very compelling uh, TV show. And, you know, the whole show is about, you know, it's like every hour, you know, they're like diet, they're trying to name, they're trying to figure out what's actually wrong with the person, you know, who goes through these dramatic illnesses. And, and then once you figure out what the problem is, you can begin applying the remedy. But it's important to figure out the disease. And so it's not only important to understand ourselves as having a problem in the first place, so that we come to the hospital in the first place and we know what the hospital is it's the church right but then we have to be even more specific and know what the specific problems are and so so often in, in you know if we uh, involve ourselves in the prayer life of the church if we hear this the hymns that we're singing um, if we if we read some of the prayers and and the lives of the of the desert fathers etc they're talking about identifying these specific sins too you know pride lust anger um, right so that you can as it were uh, own it and say yes this is my illness and yes I submit myself now to the remedy for it you know, um, another uh, example of, of how this works, a, a very potent example for many of us, is um, for those of us who might suffer from addictions, and uh, specifically alcohol, drugs, sex, gambling, whatever the addiction might be, um, if, uh, if, if one goes to and submits oneself again to a 12-step program. One of the first things you do is you you name yourself an addict. <laughs> right? Hello, I am John. I am an alcoholic. Right? That's like a very important part of the healing process is you you <coughs> name yourself in that way. You're, you're, you're as it were owning up to the disease the problem and especially in you know it's no coincidence in the case of of, of the 12-step programs you, you submit this to each other and to the higher power which for us is God the father of Jesus Christ right okay so you you you, you name it so that you can surrender it and say that you need help with this problem it's really the same thing when we're naming ourselves as sinners. We're not, you know, if I, again, I, I, I am a musician. I name myself musician. I'm a father. I name myself father. And, and, and these, these vocations, you know, that, that in a way kind of when I name myself these things, they give me license to do music, to be a choir director, to play the bass as I do, and, and to be a father to my kids and all that stuff. It, it, it 
it gives me mm, it gives me a name <laughs> that I can live into. So when I name myself sinner, that doesn't mean, oh great, now that means that I sin and you know, rah, rah, I, I, just like I make music. No, in, in, that's in a different sense. I'm owning that identity in order to identify that I have a problem and that I need help, right? And that when I now stand before the icons and pray, I am standing for the icons not as uh, some kind of a persona of a pious Christian that I find very attractive, and this is how I present myself before God, but I stand, my, I stand before the icons, I stand in the church with other sinners, everybody in the church, everybody is a sinner, right? I stand with fellow sinners, uh, as it were, naked and vulnerable as a sinner, and I surrender that, you know. Uh, so, so in this case, I think naming myself sinner, especially when I'm doing so in the mindfulness that God is merciful, that God is limitlessly merciful, then naming myself a sinner is, is no longer just negative talk about myself or it's not self-destructive or it's not, um, what's the word? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't injure me <laughs> to, to do so. It, it becomes a part of my healing. It becomes a part of my healing. And, um, you know, especially when we consider who, who Jesus really spent his time with uh, in the New Testament, when we read the New Testament, he spends his time with sinners. It's not only because everybody's a sinner, but he spends his time with specific, you know, the people who, whom society singles out as sinners, the tax collectors, harlots, you know, um, Samaritans. They had a very, very bad name among uh, the Hebrews, right? Um, and you, you almost get the sense that when, when people are that far gone, right? The tax collectors were collectively defrauding the people, you know, um, et cetera, you know. That in a way that that's where Jesus has an in. That's, that's where he has an in, right? I came not for the righteous, but for sinners. Right, um, Leonard Cohen fans, anybody, a, a musician, composer, he's uh, got a great line. There's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. And it's, al it's almost like there's a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. There's a great line from um, Metropolitan Anthony Bloom of Suraj. Um, he's very much an advocate of, um, like I said earlier, like when, you, when you're standing in prayer, uh, that, that you, you, you take a moment, it's always good to take a moment to kind of collect yourself in quiet and silence before saying anything in prayer, but um, you take a moment to uh, acknowledge who you are before God and, and to chase away all the, 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 the facades, you know, the, the false pictures of yourself that you want, that you want to present before God, but, but be before God as the, the broken person that you are, you know. And he has a great little line about it. He said, God can save the sinner you are, but not the saint you pretend to be. <laughs> Resonance, right? God can save the sinner you are, not the saint you pretend to be, right? And so, so much of our life in, in acknowledging our identity as sinners is a matter of, of um, stripping off uh, our pious self-image and, um, and, and simply being who we are. Now, of course, uh, a lot of us also wrestle with 
uh, unhealthy negative language about ourselves. You know, um, a lot of us perhaps were, were, were raised in, in, in situations where we were, we were talking about naming, where, you know, where we were called uh, bad names, even by our parents, you know, who said, you know, I, you were a mistake, I don't need you, uh, or worse, you know, or, or, or if people were raised in settings where they were abused, you know, physically and otherwise, um, it becomes very difficult then to manage this language in the church of, of, you know, I'm a wretch, I'm a sinner, because that's kind of reawakening some really uh, unhealthy uh, language that we learned about ourselves, you know. So this is something to be very, very sensitive about, very, very careful with, and it's something that... Um, that we do well to, to raise with uh, our spiritual fathers and, and mothers and you know, our, our spiritual friends um, to, to kind of to, to, to get, get these issues out so that our, our identity before God and our identity before ourselves is, is true both to the reality of our brokenness but is also true to the reality of uh, God's image in us. God created us in his image. That's something pretty good, <laughs> right? So really, the, the, the rest of what I want to say um, has to do with, with, with that, um, with, with um, plumbing our identity a little bit, right? So... I am a sinner, but I am also made in God's image, right? So are, are there like two selves in me? There's like a sinful self and then there's a, a pious self, a sinful self and, and a self made in God's image, a bad self and a good self. I mean, no, but it almost sometimes seems that way. And, and I, and I want to use some of um, St. Paul's language. It's very familiar to us to excavate that, that, that problem a little bit, all right? Um, so just to remind ourselves of some of the language we use in the church um, about ourselves. Uh, uh, we begin Great Lent. Do we have the service of Saint Canada St. Andrew of Crete on Holy, on Bright Monday? How wonderful it's called, not bright, it's clean Monday, clean Monday. Clean Monday, first day of Great Lent. In Greece, they fly kites on clean Monday. Just surrender it all to the wind, you know. And then in the evening we come and, and begin our journey of repentance with these words, how shall I begin? to mourn the deeds of my wretched life. What can I offer as first fruits of repentance? In your compassion, O Christ, forgive my sins. Um, let me just take a moment before going on to, to reflect on, uh, do, you all, do you all come to service on, on Monday night on, uh, and, and recite these words. Do you, do you find it to be a beautiful service? <laughs> Absolutely. I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, that's what's always amazing to me and, and very heartening to me is that um, there we are uh, together, together, saying this uh, and singing this and, and we involve our body in this. We, we have mercy on me, oh God, have mercy on me. And, um, and these services are somehow, not despite, but because of this language, they're seen as beautiful services. My kids are now in their 20s, but you know, even when they were teens, right? Teens who generally are struggling with 
identity issues and struggling with self hatred and self love my kids were running to these services they love these services you know as do so many of, of us somehow again the church has brought this language before us and and it puts it in our mouths and and somehow in the context of the church because we know we're in the hospital for our sin it's beautiful somehow we intuit that it is healing to come clean somehow we 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 we, we feel that you know it's especially nice in a, in a beautiful church like this and and uh and i'm i'm sure the choir sings beautifully too and and uh, that helps but that's not everything you could you can do this in a in a in a more wretched <laughs> location uh, and and somehow uh, it's it's beautiful and that's because again we, we know that we're doing this a together this I how shall I is being sung by all these different eyes and it becomes a we right the canon of St. Andrew of Crete is all I language, and then the, the refrains are we. We have sinned, we have transgressed, we have done. It's we, so that all these eyes become a we that are the community of, of the church. And like I said before, there's no one in the church who's not a sinner, and that includes the saints the saints are not saints because they're sinless the saints are saints because of what they have done with their sin right and 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 what every saint is a saint within the fallen broken condition of, of, of humanity and every saint has struggled with it and every saint has 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 worked with their own sin and brought it to the right place right in an exemplary way such that we follow their example so with the saints right with the saints all of us are this community of broken persons in need of the healing of the church and and in this kind of language is when it just comes <laughs> there's there's no more uh sugar coating right it's just it's 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 naked exposed sin right uh, amazing stuff um and so we actually ask god to give us understanding of our sins so that we may weep it's kind of so that we may cathartically right so that we can you know uh we need to have a good cry about it you know just as when, when, a, when a loved one dies sometimes the the weeping doesn't come right away sometimes it comes days weeks years later but when it comes it's like thank god you know it's a cathartic weeping this comes from another canon of repentance um that was actually it, it's as ancient as saint andrew of crete's but and it was I, I love it because it's set to music by my beloved Arvo Pert, um, whom uh, Father Alessandro mentioned this morning, but as a contemporary composer, um, and he set this whole canon to music. Now, where I'd like to go with this for uh, another ten, fifteen minutes, and then we can open it out to to discussion. Uh, these are very familiar words of St. Paul um, in Romans 7, okay? And I mentioned earlier, you know, so, you know, we're made in the image of God, but, but, uh, but we sin. So, like, we're, we're good, but we're bad. Um, or are there two selves? And, and this kind of wrestling with these two identities, as it were, uh, beloved child of God made in God's image and also person who sins. You watch Paul struggling with this. 
he just lays it out before the Romans and us. He says, I do not understand my own actions. How many can relate to that, right? Um, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I want to do right, but I don't, you know? I don't do the good that I want. The evil that I do not want is what I do. He's saying the same things in a few different ways, right? Now, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Okay, that's the first inkling we get that, that, that he senses that sin is something foreign to me. Okay, this, this, this I, right? <laughs> There, there's I who wants to do good, and then there's sin that dwells in me. It almost sounds like, again, like a disease, right? Like a foreign parasite or, or a bacteria of some sort, right? Um, so let's stick with that theme, right? He says, so I find it to be a law. In other words, it, it tends to be the case that when I want to do what's good, evil lies close at hand. And now I want us to really focus in here. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind. All right? It says, in my inmost self. How interesting, right? He, he's kind of, he, he's sensing that there's a, that there's a core a genuine core, inmost, right? In my inmost self, I delight in the law of God. In my truest self, in my inmost self. I love that line. And I think we're, we're, we're on to a hint as to how to... Uh, identify ourselves so I am a sinner when I say I'm a sinner I'm saying that this I that God created in his image this I that is a thing ultimately of beauty is something that I have allowed to become ugly. <laughs> but the beauty is still there. But the beauty is still there. A few quotes from fathers, ancient and modern, to, to, to kind of drive this point home. Uh, I think today is actually the feast day of St. John of Kronstadt. Um, and he writes beautifully, he says, never confuse the person formed in the image of God with the evil that is in him. Because evil is but a chance misfortune, illness, illness, a devilish reverie. <laughs> but the very essence, think again, inmost self, right? The very essence of the person is the image of God, and this remains in him despite every disfigurement. Never confuse um, the person with the evil that is in him. Um, in the, the, the funeral uh, hymns that we sing, uh, you know, the, the Evlogitaria, right? Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me your statutes, right? Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. I am the image of your ineffable glory. Though I bear the brands of transgressions, the brands, think of that, that's painful language to even think of. These are like, you know, singed into us. You know, we, we bear the marks, the wounds, the signs of our sin. But 
We are the image of his glory. Grant me the homeland of my heart's desire, right? In my inmost self, I desire that homeland and make me again a citizen of paradise. Restore me to that image and to my former beauty, right? So, so what we're talking about in, in, uh, in our path towards salvation and towards wholeness is a restoration, right? It's not, it's not implanting in me something that wasn't in me before, but it's, uh, it's, cleaning, it's cleaning the mirror. That's how St. Gregory of Nyssa puts it. He says that we're, we're a mirror of God, an image of God, right? But it's become dirty and it, it needs cleaning. It's a very basic, <laughs> you know, metaphor, right? What's next on my slides? Yeah. Um, now this is the same uh, canon of St. Andrew of Crete. The same canon. In the second ode, he writes, um, with passions I have darkened the beauty of my soul. And permitted my whole inward being to become a mire. Okay? So in these words, like, I, I've darkened the beauty of my soul. There's something both wonderfully inspiring and tragic at the same time. Typically the church holds together the brightness and the sadness, right? The, 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 the glorious message and the tragedy, right? The glorious message is that my soul is beautiful. <laughs> That's a pretty glorious message that we really often forget. That, that core message that the, that my soul is something created in and beauty, beauty. It's a beautiful soul, beautiful soul, beautiful soul. And the tragedy is that I've darkened it. In my own free choice, I've darkened it. That's, that's the dynamic right there. Beautiful inmost self that has been darkened by that self's own decisions, right? I persist in caring only for my outer garment while neglecting the, the temple within, right? Within, inmost self, image of God, made in the image of God, right? And then uh, in the same canon, through love of pleasure has my form become deformed and the beauty of my inward being has been ruined. Again, hope, tragedy <laughs> put together. And the hope in, in, in that whole canon lies precisely in the fact that you, that, that you are, that I am, we are acknowledging this together. In the community of the church, we're acknowledging it before the one in whose image we're created. Before the one who is, again, limitlessly merciful. So on the one hand, we, we, we say this and we approach the church and we approach the chalice with, with fear and with awe uh, and with faith and with love, right? In the fear of God and with faith and with love, we draw near. All these things come together, right? Because the person who is drawing near to the chalice, the person who is drawing near to the church is this beautiful, beautiful thing who has screwed it up, right? And, and the hope is in that we're acknowledging this before the one who can, who like the father of the prodigal is racing to meet us halfway down the road in embrace and say, yes, yes, you're in the right place. You're in the right place. I, 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 
God says, I exist to, to restore the beauty of your soul. I exist to restore the beauty of that image in which you're created. That's what I do. And, and I'm so committed to that, that, that I die for it. I, I, I submit totally to the, to the brokenness of the world to the extent of death, right, on the cross. That's how much I am committed to restoring your image, the beauty of your, of your, of your broken soul. Um, yeah. Um, I was speaking with um, Father Zacharias, uh, the monk at uh, the monastery in England, that I go to whenever I can. Um, and I asked him, um, what is the sinful self? And what is the self that I'm supposed to flee? You know, sometimes the ascetical literature even says to, to hate the self. And he says, um, what you hate is that which poses as yourself. It's your false self. It pretends to be yourself. Right? How can you hate the image of God? How can you hate this inmost self which delights in the law of God? How can you hate that? No, you hate this, this false self that thinks only about what it needs in order to be gratified. And yeah. So yeah, uh, th that's really what I wanted to put before us in this first session is um, these questions of, of identity. When I identify myself as a sinner, what am I doing, you know? Um, and I think it's really important to rule out some things. When, when I identify myself as a sinner, I don't say that sin defines who I am. I don't say that, I'm not saying that I am sin. God forbid. Right? I think what, what, what I am trying to do is to, is to make sure that this I that I have in my mind and in my heart about myself is that temple of God, that beautiful soul, that inmost self, that image of God. This is I, who is at the same time the I who, in the freedom of my choices, has made wrong choices, like all the time. <laughs> either mediocre, stupid crap, or more serious wrong choices where I've really taken some wrong choices and, and done great harm to other people and or to myself, right? And that's the I. Beautiful, broken self who's submitting that all before God. Surrendering it all before God, to draw near in faith and love with everyone. So um, reflections on that, further thoughts on that, questions on that, um, very happy to